My name is Annie Rogers, and on behalf of the Attitude team, I'm pleased to welcome you to today's ADHD Experts presentation titled Lifestyle Changes with the Biggest Impact on Kids with ADHD. First-line treatment for ADHD typically includes prescription medication and behavioral therapy. However, many caregivers are interested in supplementing their treatment plan with lifestyle changes, such as improving sleep, exercise, and nutrition. But the options and the strategies are sometimes confusing. Which one works best? What are the benefits that we can expect to see? Um, today's webinar will teach caregivers healthy habits to incorporate into a child's day and the outcomes that they can expect as a result. Leading today's presentation is Dr. Sanford Newmark. Dr. Newmark is the Director of Clinical Programs at Osher Center for Integrative Health at the University of California, San Francisco. Prior to joining the Osher Center, Dr. Newmark founded the Center for Pediatric Integrative Medicine, an integrative medicine consulting practice treating a wide array of pediatric problems. He specializes in the integrative and holistic treatment of children with autism and ADHD, combining conventional medicine with nutrition, behavior management, and various complementary modalities. Dr. Newmark lectures widely on autism and ADHD and has authored three chapters in integrative medicine textbooks. He is the author of the book, ADHD Without Drugs, A Guide to the Natural Care of Children with ADHD. Before I hand over the microphone to Dr. Newmark, I have just a few housekeeping items. Those of you tuned in to the live webinar, may submit your questions at any time by navigating to the text box under the video player. To download the slides, click on the event resources section of your webinar screen. And if you are interested in the certificate of attendance option, look for instructions in the email you will receive around an hour after the live broadcast. If you are listening in replay or podcast mode, visit attitudemag.com and search podcast 414 to access the slides, webinar replay, and certificate of attendance option. If you su support the work we're doing here at Attitude to strengthen the ADHD community, we encourage you to visit attitudemag.com slash subscribe and sign up for Attitude Magazine for your family or to share with a teacher or a loved one who could benefit from greater ADHD understanding. Finally, the sponsor of today's webinar is Accentrate. Accentrate is a dietary supplement formulated to address nutritional deficiencies known to be associated with ADHD. It contains omega-3 fatty acids in phosphorus lipid form, the form already in the brain. This brain-ready nutrition helps manage inattention, lack of focus, emotional dysregulation, and hyperactivity without drug-like side effects. Click the link on your screen or visit phenixhealthscience.com, that's phenixhealthscience.com, to learn more. Attitude thanks our sponsors for supporting our webinars. Sponsorship has no influence on speaker selection or webinar content. Without any further ado, I'm so pleased to welcome Dr. Newmark. Thank you so much for joining us today and for leading this really important and interesting discussion. And I will hand it over to you to, uh, to begin from there. Thank you, Dr. Newmark. Thank you. I wanted to thank everybody who's listening for taking the time to be here with me now. And uh, I hope I can make it uh, interesting and uh, very worth your while. So what I wanted to uh, begin with is uh, kind of a caveat. 
this is not a talk about lifestyle changes instead of ADHD medication. These lifestyle factors are important whether a child is taking a medication or not. In my practice, I see many kids with ADHD and some of them are on medication and some of them are not, just depending on the individual circumstances. But even if somebody is on medication, these lifestyle changes can have a large impact. The second thing I wanted to show you all is, I think, a really important part of understanding what ADHD is about. So ADHD, uh, as defined and as in practice, refers to uh, children who have a hyperactivity, distractibility, or lack of intention, and impulsivity that causes impact in their life at home and at school. Now, there's also, of course, the inattention type in which it's only the attention and not the impulsivity or uh, hyperactivity. But what this slide is, is there to show you is that all of the traits of ADHD are just normal human traits that exist along a continuum. So some kids are naturally quiet and some kids are naturally pretty active. Some kids are just easily focused right from the beginning and some kids tend to be distractible to move from one thing to another. And some kids are very careful and look very carefully before they do anything new. And some kids are impulsive and ready to do anything. Now, over there on the left are the quiet, focused, careful kids. And over there on the right are the kids who are more active, distractible, and impulsive. But all of that can be normal. You can have a highly active, relative, relatively distractible child who's impulsive, and who is still having school success, is doing well at home, has friends, that kid does not have ADHD. It's only when the degree of activity, the degree of distractibility, the degree of impulsivity becomes so severe as to cause a negative impact on that child's life that we would call it ADHD. And then the final thing to notice about this slide is I put in a risk group. And that's kids who are on the active, distractible, impulsive side, but doing okay, or could be doing okay. But cert certain things happen that throw them over. And those things could be stress, lack of sleep, poor diet, pesticides, any of a number of things that change their um, nutrition, change their physiology, change their um, social environment, even sometimes the wrong school, and suddenly a child who's doing well or has ADHD, or a child who might have been able to do well doesn't do well because of these factors. And that's some of the things we'll discuss. Start with exercise. For some children, exercise really makes a dramatic difference. As I quote here, I, I can't tell you how many moms have said to me, if my son doesn't get out there and play every single day, life is hell. For other children, it may not be so obvious, it may be more subtle, or it may take more time, but exercise is really important. We as a species were not built, our brains were not built to sit all day. And that's as true for adults as for kids. It's true for kids who don't have ADHD as well. And there's multiple research studies that show a clear benefit in ADHD for most children. Even a single bout of 20 minutes of aerobic exercise in one study improved kids' attention immediately after. In another study, they hooked them up to an EEG. And you know, um, kids with ADHD often have an abnormal brain pattern, uh, an abnormal pattern of brain waves. And just regular exercise changed that abnormal brain wave pattern. Now, how much it's, it's interesting that some genetic studies 
so show that how much exercise a particular child would need to be helped and may have a genetic basis. And this is based on something called BDNF, uh, bone-derived neurotrophic factor. And this is stuff that actually comes from bones and muscles and goes to the brain and uh, increases uh, the development of neurons, of nerve cells. And there may be a genetic component that uh, determines how well that uh, happens. So how much exercise? It's probably different for different kids. Everything is. The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends 60 minutes of activity most days. So what's most days? To me, five times a week is my recommendation. Seven days a week is better. Now, PE at school will count if it's really exercise. Now, sometimes I hear about PE at school and it is not really exercise, which is a shame. It, it may, they may spend time learning physiology or biology or, or they may allow kids to walk around the exercise, uh, around the, the yard or something. They don't feel like exercising. Not good enough. It has to be intense enough to increase heart rate. Work up a sweat, as we say. That's exercise. Uh, relaxed dog walking does not count as exercise. So what kind of exercise? It's really easy if your child likes sports. You know, you just get them to play sports. It's great. They play soccer. They play uh, basketball. They play lacrosse, whatever it is they play. Um, but many kids with ADHD don't like sports. And the, especially the team sports are really difficult for them. Um, there's, again, too much talking from coaches, too much time where you have to sit and listen, sometimes too many things to keep track of. Um, baseball is a terrific example of that. You know, in baseball, you're pretty much sitting still for about 98% of the time. Half the time you're in the dugout, the other time you're standing there in the field, and the younger you are, the worse of an exercise it is. <clears throat> but for some kids, they really like it anyway. For kids with ADHD, individual sports like swimming or tennis can be a lot better. So there's only like one thing to focus on. You know, if you're playing tennis, the ball gets hit, gets hit back to you, you have to hit it back. That's it. Swimming, similarly. Bicycle riding is a great sport for kids with ADHD. They can kind of go at their own pace. They can ride hard. Um, martial arts can be very beneficial. I, I don't know why it is, but martial arts sometimes are just tremendous for kids with ADHD. Um, sometimes you'll see kids who can never sit still, sitting entirely quietly and then Doing their uh, doing their exercise and or their routine exactly when they're supposed to, how they're supposed to. And I don't know what's up with that really, but I've had many families tell tell me that exercise is great, that martial arts is great for them. Um, you want to be really careful who the teacher is and where where they're doing it. Obviously, you want uh, Mr. Miyagi from the Karate Kid, not the other guy. So, but it, it really can be helpful. I don't think it matters a lot which martial art it is. One thing I really encourage is don't stop sports or any other activities your child is good at so that they have more time to study or go to tutoring. It's not worth it. They need to exercise for their health, for their brain. And what if your child hates exercise? Some kids with ADHD just are really poorly coordinated. They've had negative experiences when they started sports earlier. They have negative experience PE, they're teased, insulted. So for those kids, what do you do? They don't want to go out and exercise. They don't want to do anything. So one thing I found, two things I found that may be helpful. So we'll talk about screen time later, but if your child likes screens, which I think is probably about 99% true, you can get an exercise bike or a treadmill and tell them if they want their screen time, 
They have to do it while they're exercising. Get them on a bike or a treadmill with a little thing to hold their tablet and they can look at their screen while they exercise. They can look at YouTube, movies, whatever. Sometimes it's a little hard to play an active video game while you're doing that, but some kids even do it. I've had kids who do that for an hour easily. If that's the reward, if that's what they get to do with it. The other thing is sometimes these kids, if you get them to a gym with their own physical trainer, they're willing to do it. So they can actually do muscle building exercises. This will increase their self-confidence, how they feel about their body. And usually that's, um, that's combined with aerobics with any good uh, physical trainer or personal trainer. Now, that's probably the muscle building part of, you know, we're probably looking at kids at 11 or 12 or up to, to do that kind of uh, weight stuff. But that can be really helpful for these teenagers who are just absolutely adamant about not wanting to get any exercise. The next topic is sleep. Sleep is just a vitally important. I'm sure many of you have seen this with your children. The research is entirely clear. One, one systemic review, which is we call it when somebody looks at lots of articles, found 148 studies about sleep and ADHD. And here were their findings. Sleep disturbances are common in ADHD. Sleep disturbances affect ADHD symptoms. They make them better or worse. I mean, disturbances make them worse. And treating sleep disturbances improves ADHD. So we know that. So if your child isn't sleeping well, their ADHD is probably going to be worse. And, you know, basically a tired child can't function to their potential at school or at home. So how much sleep do kids need? It's really variable. This is from the AEP, AAP. And, but, you know, mostly your school-age kids are going to need 9 to 12 hours of sleep, I mean, just depending. And uh, teenagers need 8 to 10 hours, and so many teenagers get less. Now, kids have different sleep needs. And you have to really look at your child and see if at school age they're the ones who need 9 or they're the ones who need 12. And, you know, you just look at them saying, you know, how tired are they when they wake up? It's really difficult to get them out of bed. Do they, do they seem tired through much of the day? They lose their energy. So there's a couple of problems with ADHD and sleep, and the most common is a difficulty falling asleep. Most kids with ADHD, once they're asleep, will stay asleep. But difficulty falling asleep is really common. Kids just sort of can't turn off their minds. You know, their minds are racing. They have all these thoughts. And even with good intentions, they'll just lie there, sometimes for hours. Um, so what are the things you can do about it? Um, sleep hygiene is the concept of what are the things that make it easy for a child or an adult to fall asleep? What are the simple things you can do? Well, one of the big ones is turn off screens about 45 minutes before bedtime. So what happens with screens is that light coming out of your computer or tablet turns off your melatonin. Melatonin is how your body gets you to go to sleep. The melatonin cycle is why when it's light, you wake up, and when it's dark, you go to sleep. Before we had electricity, when the sun rose, the melatonin was shut off got up. When the sun went down, the melatonin started and we went to sleep. So turning off the screens can be really helpful. Quiet place, soothing activity. I mean, this is sort of obvious. If you're just running around like crazy right before bed, it's not going to be easy to fall asleep. Bedtime rituals can be really important. Just doing that same thing in the last, you know, 15, 20 minutes before bed. If it's reading a story, or um, a quiet time and, or uh, some other, some music, whatever. Just 
if it's the same, if it's really predictable, the brain will get to use it, to uh, used to it. White noise can be helpful if some kids are really noise sensitive and just the slightest noise in the house will keep them up. Or, you know, they'll hear their parents or siblings moving around. So some kind of white noise machine can be really helpful. And that can even, that can play either under differentiated noise or even some types of music. You don't want to give hot baths and indoor exercise before bed. Now that's an interesting one. I always thought hot baths were good. You know, they're quite, they're calming. And, but uh, one of my uh, sleep physiologist friends and, and uh, research has shown that falling asleep has to do with body temperature. And if your body temperature gets too hot, it becomes harder to fall asleep. So you can give a bath if if it's you know lukewarm to warm, but don't not hot enough to heat up the body. Another thing that can help is guided imagery or meditation audios. These are these are audios that are made by uh, people who are skilled in the field to help kids fall asleep. They work well for adults as well, and they they simply have relaxing imagery. Sometimes talking uh, about Depending on the age, for, for little kids, it might be fairies or things like that. For uh, older kids, it might have to do with uh, nature meditations. But they're made for different ages, and, and children listen to them, and they can be really helpful. There's herbs like valerian, chamomile, lavender oil. The chamomile and valerian are taken by mouth. Lavender oil is usually put in a diffuser and it just puts out a lavender smell throughout the room. And that can be helpful. And finally, lots of people use melatonin. This is a bit controversial. It's melatonin, as I said, is the hormone that keeps you, um, that it enables you to go to sleep and we can replace it exactly. And for some kids, it works just dramatically well. Now, there uh, are people who worry about its safety because you're, what if you're shutting off the body's own melatonin and it becomes kind of addictive? I haven't found that to be the case. I use melatonin frequently, and most of the time people can stop using it without any problem. But um, there are people who have different opinions about that. One thing I will say about melatonin, which uh, I didn't write down here, if you're going to use it, start very low. Many kids, many people start at two or three milligrams, but many kids can actually fall asleep easier or easily with 0.25 milligrams or 0.5 milligrams. And the way to get that is through a liquid usually. The other thing you have to really be uh, alert to is obstructive sleep apnea. This is very common. This means that when a child lies down, the airway, which brings oxygen to their lungs and heart and body, is cut off by the upper respiratory system in some way. And what happens is they don't get normal sleep. They may be asleep all night, but they don't go through the normal stages of sleep, which are so important for uh, rejuvenation of the brain. How do you know if somebody has this? Well, loud snoring is obvious. Respiratory pauses where they go, <laughs> you know, and sort of stop and maybe turn over and then start breathing again. Restless sleep. If your child is really restless all night, you know, the covers end up on the other side of the room, they're all over, it may be okay, but it may be a sign of sleep apnea. Also, being very tired in the morning can be a sign of sleep apnea. If your child has any of these symptoms, you should see your doctor and discuss whether a sleep study is indicated. And also check the serum ferritin, which is a measure of storage iron and the iron it gets to the brain. Low serum ferritin, low but even within normal limits, is associated with restless sleep in a significant way. And so sometimes just treating with, with iron can really help that problem. Next, stress and ADHD. Well, we know everyone has stress. Stress is a part of life. Stress is important. But some kids with ADHD are very sensitive to stress. 
part of that is that children with ADHD can be exposed to such a great deal of criticism, teasing, bullying on a regular basis. This is stressful beyond what most of us have to put up with, and it can really impair performance. If a little bit of stress can actually improve performance, this has been tested with much research, but too much stress actually decreases performance. And ironically, and this is something I just stress over and over again, kids with ADHD often have great skills in certain areas, but they spend very little time doing what they're good at and lots of time doing what's hard for them. I like to use myself as an example. I was always really good at reading and math in school and terrible at art, any kind of art. What about the kid who's great at art and not so good at math and reading? They're spending almost all of their time at school and at homework doing math and reading, which they're not good at and not doing art that they are good at. What if I had to go to the school where I was doing art five and a half hours a day and reading a half an hour? What would do that do to my stress level, to my feelings of competence and worth, self-esteem? So really important. It's not just individual stress. We live in a really, really stressful and disjointed society. Now, this may not, uh, may not apply to all of you. There may be many of you who live in very relaxed communities and in a uh, and in a non-stressful environment, but I guarantee you many people who, who are listening to this don't. They live in a disjointed, stressful society. We have increased number, number of single parent families or two working parents so that there's less time for kids to have a parent at home. We ask mothers to work long hours during their pregnancy and that work continues at home. And we know that maternal stress can contribute. We don't have normal maternal and family leave uh, laws like they do in most of the industrialized countries in the world. So we don't have anybody to kind of take care of. We don't have a mom there to, or the dad to take care of babies when they're infants. All these things increase community stress. We also have really high mobility. How many of you live where your parents and community are, where you were brought up? Now, that can be really helpful. We get to move, we get to get better jobs, we get to live in places we like better, but we also lose a community. We don't have a grandmother around to help. We don't have aunts and cousins around to help. We have kids who have to go to pre-care at school and then school and then after care. So they're gone from the house from seven in the morning till six in the evening. We have nuclear families that have no help for their kids. They're, they're working, they don't have anybody around who could really help them unless they have to pay people. And many people can't afford that. Even our neighborhoods, uh, where I was growing up, even though it was in a sort of a city, it was in Queens and New York City, I knew all my neighbors. My parents knew all my neighbors. They all kind of watched out for us. And many of us now hardly know our neighbors at all. We've all moved and we might live in cities or we might live in suburbs. We knew just a couple of them. Though all of this loss of community increases family stress and increases stress on kids. Oh, let me just say though, that I don't have a great suggestion about what to do about that. That's something that's really difficult. The, the one thing I will say is that sometimes if people were to ask me about where they should buy a house in our area, they're buying a new house, the one thing I would say is look for a place where your kids can play outside, where there's a community and it's safe. That more than anything else, I think would be really important, especially with an ADHD kid. Now, what about mind-body? Mind-body means things that you do with the mind that can affect how the body and the brain 
work, how they function. And you can see the list here. We're going to talk about electronic media in a minute. That's a big one. But decreasing electronic media is a huge one. But for some kids, yoga or meditation can be very helpful in ADHD. Uh, uh, something that goes along with that is mindfulness training. Mindfulness is basically, it's called mindfulness-based stress reduction. And it's a kind of meditation that's been put into a kind of a package. And uh, there's a lot of research showing that meditation or mindfulness can help kids with ADHD. In fact, it can help all school kids. There's some studies where they do uh, mindfulness training in schools, and, and the next thing you know, all the kids are focusing better, behaving better, less impulsive. Hypnotherapy is another kind of thing that can be hopeful. We talked about exercise and martial arts. Time and nature, I'll talk about that a little bit later, but those are all kind of mild body things that can be helpful. Now, nutrition. Nutrition, of course, is huge. Now, I'm not going to spend too much time on it today because I have lectured about it. I've done a webinar on it. Um, so I'm just going to go over the basics. It's there's so much to it, but basically, the basic principles I have are, number one, avoid processed food as much as you can. Make sure the food that you serve your child has protein and fiber as well as carbs. Because pro what the big problem is that sugar and processed carbs are too high, and, and sugar well, increases blood sugar. And then the blood sugar gets too high, it goes down, and the child has low blood sugar, and now they're they're acting like their ADHD is worse, or they're acting like an ADHD child because they have low blood sugar. Processed carbs do the same thing because they turn into sugar in your body very quickly. A great example would be waffles. Waffles are so highly processed to get that flour to be so light that the carbs in there turn into sugar almost immediately. So if you give your child, say, waffles with syrup for breakfast, they're basically getting sugar plus sugar. We know that artificial colors and flavors are a problem. Omega-3 fatty acids are important. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Make sure there's not iron deficiency. And eat organic as much as possible. I know it's more expensive, and for some people it's difficult, but increased pesticide levels are associated with increased ADHD. And fortunately now, places like uh, Walmart and Costco are carrying a fair amount of organic foods. Here's a really interesting thing. It turns out that some kids with ADHD are actually sensitive, not allergic, but sensitive to certain foods. And if you eliminate those foods, the ADHD can get much better. I'm just showing you this study where they did a very strict illumination diet. As you can see, it gave kids just rice, meat, vegetables, pears, water for uh, five weeks. And 64% of the kids had a 40% improvement on their ADHD reading skills. That's the kind of improvement you would see with Ritalin. So it's pretty impressive. And that study has been done several times. So sometimes on an elimination diet is worth doing. Food dyes. We know that food dyes make not only ADHD kids, but most kids more hyper. In Europe, they have looked at their research and made the decision to put a warning label on foods with food dyes. And there's the warning label. And it's interesting. Kraft macaroni and cheese got that warning label in Europe. They immediately switched to using a natural yellow dye made from uh, an insect, actually, instead of an artificial yellow. They didn't do that in the United States because there wasn't a warning until just till a couple of years of consumer activism got them to do it. So really avoid artificial colors and flavors. We know that omega-3 fatty acids are a kind of fat that's important for the brain. It's a fat that lines the the nerve cells in the brain and helps them work better. If you don't have enough omega-3s, your nerve cells are lined with omega-6s and they don't work as well. There's been tons of studies showing that omega-3s are helpful for ADHD. This is one 
what we call meta-analysis, where they combine the statistics for lots of different studies. Um, whoops, oh, yeah, there you go. Um, and, now, and this meta-analysis, there were 40% of this effective as stimulants, which is pretty significant, really. One thing that people often, oh, so I actually uh, recommend omega-3s or fish oil in the form of fish oil for almost every child I see with ADHD. Iron deficiency can definitely worsen ADHD. And what happens is most kids with ADHD, that serum ferritin I was talking about with sleep, most kids with ADHD have way lower iron or serum ferritin than kids who don't have ADHD. And studies have shown that giving iron can actually improve it. So it's not enough to get just a little poke in the finger and get a hemoglobin and hematocrit from your pediatrician. They need to actually do a blood test and check the ferritin. In this study, it showed that if you took kids whose ferritin was less than 30 and gave them iron, their ADHD got better. I like to use a chelated form of iron because it tends to cause less constipation. Now, what are you gonna do if your child doesn't want to eat what you want them to eat? So here is like a really important thing to live by. Your job is to offer your child the food you want them to eat when you want them to eat it. Their job is to decide to eat it or not. So basically what that means, if they're wanting to eat waffles and syrup for breakfast and you don't want them to eat that, you offer them a more healthful breakfast. You might offer them some choices. If they won't eat any of them, then they don't eat. Same thing for lunch or dinner. They will not starve to death. They will start eating really quickly. The only kids that doesn't apply to are some kids with severe autism, but that's a different category. Now, with teenagers, you know, all bets are off. Obviously, they're going to eat what they want when they're outside of the house. They have money. They may be driving. All you can do is control what they eat in the house. But that can be really important. Quick thing about play. One of the things that we don't do in our society with our children is let them play. Just play by themselves. And unstructured creative play is really important for normal development. Soccer practice, violin lessons, chess club are not play. They may be great things to do, but they're still an adult supervising. And we need kids to play together without adults there to how to learn how to work things out, forge social relationships, get along with each other. And for kids with ADHD, this is especially important. So I encourage letting kids play when you can, by themselves, without adults. So if, if it's safe, let kids bicycle around the neighborhood, run around, play ball with other kids. If that's not safe, at least, safe, at least when kids are on play dates in the house or the yard, leave them alone and look for summer programs that emphasize maximizing independent play. Those are just a few things you can do to help that. There's even studies that show that exposure to nature can improve ADHD. This is just a couple of studies, not really totally known, but many kids with ADHD find nature very calming. And actually one really interesting study had kids exercise for the exact same amount of time in a city, a park, or really in nature. And the kids who exercise in nature did better on a focusing test right afterwards than either of the other conditions. There's a nice book by uh, Richard Love called Last Child in the Woods, you might want to look at. And finally, screen time. Screen time is the most difficult problem I deal with in my practice. It is, it haunts many families. It is the most difficult and, and argument producing problem in many families. And it is too much screen time is bad for kids. We know that. 
And now, I mean, I used to say it could go up to six hours a day, eight hours, 10 hours. I know that the schools are often having kids do all of their work on screens. It could be all day. It could be literally almost every moment of the day kids are on screens. It's not a good idea. So there's a lot of studies that correlate increased TV and video games with ADHD. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the ADHD is being caused by the TV and video games. Maybe the kids who have ADHD are playing more TV and video games because they have ADHD, or maybe their ADHD parents can't think of anything else to do with them. But we do know there's a subset of kids whose ADHD is severely affected by screen time in a dramatic way. And this is, um, this is the kid who parents tell me if they get any screen time at all, they are ruined for the next, the rest of the day. They get irritable, they get angry, they lose their focus. You can't get them off of there without their losing their temper. And those kids you really have to be careful with. And the other thing we know is that several studies confirm loss of sleep time related to electronics worsens performance. So a lot of kids will do electronics at night and then their performance worsens. I just wanted to show you this. This is not applying to most of your kids who are already diagnosed with ADHD. But in this study in Canada, they looked at five-year-olds and they asked how much screen time they had they had at five years old and how much they had when they were three. Those kids who watched more than two hours a day of screens as three years old are almost six times as likely to report attention problems, six times. So if you have smaller kids, you really want to keep them with very limited screen time. I don't care if it's educational TV, Sesame Street, Mr. Rogers, Port, uh, the pig one, whatever that is, or whatever. So what to do about it? Well, you really need to look at the effect of screen time on your individual child. How does it affect their mood and their attention? What are they not doing because of screen time? Are they not playing outside because of screen time? Are they not seeing their friends because of screen time? Are they not reading a book because of screen time? All that's really important. But what are they doing with their screen time? Even though in general, screen time can, can be a problem in anybody, I think there is a difference between kids who are in Minecraft with their friends online building cities versus kids playing Mortal Kombat all alone, versus kids obsessively scrolling through TikTok videos for hours on end. So that's that part is important. Versus maybe family television time. As they say, teenagers can lose a lot of sleep related to screen time. They will do anything to sneak electronics to their, to their room to text or play games. Some families just have to collect and lock up all the electronics. Others have to turn off the internet completely. For some kids with severe reactions to screens, they may not be able to tolerate any at all. There's a really interesting book called Reset Your Child's Brain, which talks about having absolute cold turkey screen time removal for months on end. And several of my families have done that and found it very, very helpful. And the interesting part is the kids say, it wasn't that bad. Behavioral management, well, I'm running out of time, so I'll try and get through this as well as I can. Some kids with ADHD don't have a behavior problem, but many of the hyperactive and oppositional kids can be very difficult to parent. Many parents are frustrated, confused, angry, helpless, guilty. Nothing works. And sometimes the parents end up alternating between angry and giving up and letting things go, which is confusing for the child. There are methods that work for this. There's many approaches. I believe in some type of positive parenting approach. What does that mean, positive parent? As I've said, these kids spend much of their day getting criticism and negative feedback from teachers, peers, and maybe even you. 
It's important to recognize and encourage what they do right as frequently as possible. Authoritative parenting, that supportive, positive parenting, but not permissive, not authoritarian, which is negative, cold parenting, is what works best. Sometimes family counseling, counseling or individual therapy for older kids can be helpful. My favorite is the nurtured heart approach. That's one type of positive parenting, which I find to be really, really helpful. Cognitive behavioral therapy can be good for adolescents and adults too. And it's shown to be almost as helpful as, as medication. There's one school I wanna tell you about called the Tolson School, which is in Tucson where I came from. And in the Tolson School, it was a failing school. 75% of the kids were from low-income families. And the entire school began to apply the nurtured heart approach. This includes behavioral management based on highly increased positive feedback, clear rules, well-defined consequences, but given without energy or emotion. In that school, discipline problems dropped, special education referrals dropped, and ADHD medication dropped. At the same time, it became a performing plus school, which is a big deal in Arizona. So final thoughts, they only get to be kid once. Do what you can so they're happy now. My primary goal as an ADHD doc is to make sure self-esteem is preserved. Less than perfect grades in fourth or eighth grade won't hurt your child, even if he or she, quote, could do better, unquote and to always look for their strengths and best qualities and enjoy them together. Thank you. I really appreciate your attendance and your, uh, and your attention. Dr. Newmark, thank you so much for that presentation. I know that my notebook is full and we received um, quite a few questions from our audience. So I will jump right into those. Um, I have uh, sort of going off of the nurtured heart approach that you were just um, describing. We do have a question from many parents, actually, whose children also have oppositional defiant disorder or who are simply adolescents. Um, and one wrote in to say that her son is risk averse and fights anything that's offered to him as if his life is in danger, getting him to agree to participate in a new sport or try a new food um, sort of triggers this oppositional defiance. Um, he's 13. <laughs> what is a good way forward for this parent? Well, I do think the nurtured heart approach will help because I, I think what, what, what that really significant risk aversion is about is about lack of confidence which is you know which comes over many years of um, somewhat negative feedback or even negative self-feedback when uh, because of uh, the ADHD I think at 13 counseling might direct therapy counseling might help that as well but again just a really positive approach um, uh, lots of uh, uh, accenting whatever strengths and, and positive things they do. So in the nurtured or hard approach, you, you actually work sometimes to find something good that a child did. And it could be as simple as bringing a dish to the, to the sink after they're done eating or pu pushing their chair in or putting their seatbelt on. And as these build up, the child is is encouraged to try and do more and more. Very interesting. So the, your first step, if your child is extremely resistant, which I'm hearing quite a bit in the comments, your first step may be to start implementing this nurtured heart approach and work to build up that self-confidence before you really try to um, make ch other lifestyle changes. I wouldn't say before, because you want to make sure they're having enough sleep and they're eating well and they're, you know, they're getting what exercise you can get them to do. I wouldn't say before, but certainly uh, as part of it. Okay, that's important. That distinction. Thank you. Um, along those lines, we, 
received another question from a parent whose child has um, ADHD and autism and said that they're really struggling with a lot of these um, lifestyle choices. Um, which of these changes should we focus on first? She asks, where can we get the most bang for our buck? <laughs> yeah, so that's, it's really hard to say uh, with any individual, you know, any individual child without knowing what, what's going on with them. I would say you, you certainly want to make sure that they're getting enough sleep that, and that they're getting good nutrition, which with kids with autism, I agree, can be really difficult. Um, you want to make sure they're not spending too much of time on screens and in some way try and get them uh, enough exercise. Um, but the, the treatment of autism is, is a little bit different, a little bit more complex because I do that as well. Right. And as we know, it's a, a common comorbid condition with ADHD. And we are hearing a lot from parents who are um, balancing more than one yeah. diagnosis. Um, quite right. a that few. Could be here. A webinar, actually. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Autism slash ADHD is, is just a whole subject in itself. I agree. And so many nuances there that are important here. Um, another condition or um, circumstance that seems quite common is that of um, sensory sensitivities among children and how that impacts their nutrition and their willingness to take supplements. Um, so maybe we start with the supplements. Are there, um, I know, for example, that there are liquid-based um, omega-3 fatty acid fish oil supplements. Do you know of any other um, solutions for those kids who are, you know, have sensory sensitivities? Yes, yeah, yeah. So there's supplement, getting kids to take supplements is something I live with regularly. Um, as you say, with fish oil, there's liquids that, and sometimes you even have to try two or three of them until you find the one that your kid likes best. Um, I've done that. There's also some um, really small little gels that they, they can either chew or swallow. And ironically, some of these kids with sensory issues would rather have these little gels than, than even the liquids. Um, other other things you can't. It's really hard to get enough fish oil and gummies. But other supplements, for instance, it's a, a good multivitamin comes in, in gummies. Uh, uh, I like this kind called Smarty Pants multivitamins, which sound like they'd be kind of goofy, but they're actually quite a good multivitamin, and they come in gummies. There's other there's other things where you can empty a capsule into some kind of food. Um, this uh, I've had parents take fish oil and melt chocolate, put a week's worth of fish oil into the melted chocolate, stir it up, let it cool, and break it into daily um, daily portions. So that's the kind of creativity that um, you can use to try and get these kids to take it. That is very, I've, I have not heard that solution before. <laughs> um, that is very creative. Yeah, and strong. I wonder. I've had people put either fish oil or other things into, into a juice and mix it and put it into an ice pot. It's like those. Mm, mm -hmm. Smart. Um, it, it's really heartbreaking to hear some of these parents who are, you know, absolutely hear your message about the importance of, nutrition and they are raising picky eaters, whether it's because of diagnosed sensory sensitivities or um, sometimes the impact of, of medication. Um, can you offer any other creative solutions for these parents who feel that they are at wit's end getting their yeah, children to eat? I, I do you know? get that. Yeah. I do get that. I, I will say again, and unless your child has autism, Almost all other kids, if they get hungry, will eat. So the first thing is just not to allow them to eat stuff you don't want them to eat. Um, and even if, you know, a child could not eat a single morsel. Um, of food for two days and they would be healthy as long as they drank water. So, I mean, 
and I'm not recommending they do that. But the, the point is, if you take away the food they don't want and give them some good choices of foods they might want, that, that usually works. So, um, but it, you know, it's a process and it can be hard. I agree. Yes, yes. And there are uh, a number of uh, cookbooks I know dedicated specifically to this. So um, lots of resources right. out there. It really comes down to, yeah, patience and, and creativity, which are yeah, not, easy, not an easy that, That's the other thing I guess I would say. You know, if you feel like your child's, you know, eating a really poor diet, you don't have to change the whole diet at once. You know, just change what they give them for you give them for breakfast. I actually think that's really, really important anyway, because they're going off to school. You know, just change a little at a time and you know, eventually you'll get there. Yes, good advice. One step at a time. Um, on the topic of nutrition, a few people wrote in to ask whether um, magnesium and also vitamin D um, have any proven benefits for individuals with ADHD children specifically. Yeah, yeah. So um, I didn't get it. I didn't have enough time to go into all the nutritional things. When I check, when I see any kid with ADHD, I check the iron level, vitamin D, and zinc, all of which have been proven to make a difference. So that's what I would go check. I would ask my pediatrician to check. Uh, we don't check magnesium levels because they're almost always normal. The body keeps it at a very uh, a very definitive level, but for some kids, magnesium actually can be quite relaxing. Um, sometimes it's helpful before bed, or if kids are having a rebound from their medication, magnesium can be really helpful. But um, I would encourage everybody to help a kid with ADHD to ask the pediatrician to get a CBC, serum ferritin, vitamin D, and zinc. Pretty simple. Okay, good checklist. Um, I'll turn here toward um, activity. Um, a couple of parents have written in to ask whether you've ever heard of physical activity being included in a child's IEP. Oh, what an interesting question. Oh, my gosh. The answer is no, and boy, what a great idea. <laughs> that was my oh, reaction too. <laughs> now I'm learning something, which I always do in these things. Um, that's a really terrific idea. Whether schools would be willing to do it or not, I'm not sure. But um, I mean, the question could could definitely be addressed. W one thing I do see is sometimes they'll let kids out of PE for various poor reasons. So definitely in an IEP, you could make sure if if the child can participate in regular uh, PE, that they be given some kind of physical activity. But great question and great idea. Yes. Um, and you mentioned earlier that uh, exercise really has to elevate your heart rate in order to, yeah. to do good work. Um, is there a sort of baseline um, number of minutes? So if a parent were trying to get this into the IEP, um, in an ideal scenario? It's yeah, so there's ideal and there's there's what's reasonable. Right. You know, um, you know like, so the AP says 60 minutes. Well, that's probably a lot to ask. It, even 20 minutes would be decent and 30 minutes would be nice. 30 minutes, if you could get your child, you know, with an increased heart rate for 30 minutes, that would be terrific. Excellent. And I did want to mention that... Um, like a number of people were asking about mindfulness and meditation for children with ADHD that we will follow up with the resources to this webinar with some links to um, articles that we have specifically about this topic. There are ways to engage children with ADHD in mindfulness that do not include, you know, sitting in the lotus position for an hour. Oh, so, no. <laughs> Every, you know, lotus position is not important. Although kids can do that a lot easier than we can, you know, generally. But uh, <laughs> you know, there's lots of apps you can use these days that are good. So I'm glad. Yeah, I'm sure you have those when you follow up. Yes, and we have actually had a whole webinar on this topic. So it is too much to cram in right here at the end. Unfortunately, we are out of time for today's 
presentation. Um, I did want to uh, thank our sponsor, Accentrate, one more time for sponsoring this webinar. And thank you so much to Dr. Newmark for giving us so much really useful and practical information for uh, guiding our children's health. Um, we hope that everyone who joined us today will come back for another Attitude webinar. Our next one um, next week is about relieving back to school anxiety uh, strategies for caregivers and educators of anxious students. We hope you can join us for that. Um, and in order to make sure you don't miss any future Attitude webinars, you can sign up to receive alerts at attitudemag.com slash newsletters. Thank you again, Dr. Newmark, and thanks to everyone who joined us today for this conversation.